but thanks so much for being here and i think maybe uh, to get started i'm not sure if harish is on the call yet harish okay and no, i don't think he's here yet uh, but just to get started i think maybe uh if we could get a context on how the situation is where you are right now uh you know we're all in complete lockdown uh we're all working yeah. from home it's a whole new world for selco because i think over 75 of us percent of us just sort of depend on a lot of field work and uh you know meetings in person and things like that so um i think you know just understanding what is the situation like uh where you are uh, maybe we can start with that okay well um I'm in Seattle, Washington, which was the first place in the United States that the coronavirus really hit with something of a vengeance. It, it hit an old person's home and uh, a large fraction of the people in that retirement home uh, got ill and several of them have died. And so we got a lot of attention in the early days. Uh, Seattle has, has now responded finally fairly well. There are lots of tests available. I've been tested for coronavirus. And uh, the, the real epicenters in the United States are now much more in New York and California. Uh, we're, we're still being very careful and everybody's working from home. We're going to be here for at least another two or three weeks working from home. Uh, but uh, by, by and large, it's, it's fairly normal compared to the scenes that we're seeing from India where your railroad is shut down and people are stranded at depots and have no idea how they're going to get home. And, uh, we, yeah. I don't think we have anything of, of that sort happening. In, in oh, my... okay. okay. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just joining in, Dennis. Uh, welcome. Sorry, I was trying to find the link, and I somehow got so many links today that I was trying to get all <laughs> Dennis. Welcome, Dennis, uh, to my uh, to the whole team of Selco. We are around 85 participants, Dennis. Uh, for all the colleagues who know that you are a legend in the environmental field, you thought about the whole process of uh, 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 a whole thought process of earth and sustainability before even a lot of my colleagues uh, parents were even born so i think uh, i think it's it's an honor for all of us dennis and um, that you have taken such an early call from seattle um, so we just wanted this uh, 45 minutes to an hour just to um, just to look at uh, one is to obviously some of the basic questions that I'm sure numerous people have asked uh, over the years to you, Dennis, in terms of uh, in 1970. Harish, when... quickly, I mean, uh, Dennis is just in the middle of talking about what the situation is like in. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Sorry. I think he also mentioned that he got tested as well, so we're glad oh, he's well and safe. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, he was. I was just telling him how our situation is, so you can maybe take off from. Yes. I am Dennis, you mean? I mean, I would let uh, Dennis continue. And okay, sure, sure. Okay, okay. Sorry. sorry, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, I, I pretty well completed. I, I, I think that the United States is finally getting its act together, other than the president of our country, who doesn't seem to understand this at the level of a sixth grade student. Uh, but our public health professionals and the governors and mayors and at lower levels in our government, the response is finally beginning to get in decent shape. We need to have more ventilators. We need to have more surgical masks. We need all sorts of things, but we're, we're gearing up now to get into shape. How are things going in India? Well, I'll, uh, I will start and then Huda and Sarah jump in. I guess we have, we have started our 21 day continuous lockdown. The, the issue is unlike other countries, uh, um, it is going to be a little more socially challenging because a 50 to 60 percent of the people who earn who whose earnings are on a daily basis um, uh, absolutely zero savings because they earn on a daily whether it's street vendors construction workers homeless everything that's a huge population and do we have the resources and the bandwidth to actually maintain that because there's also rumblings uh, a little bit of the rumblings um, in terms of uh, whether should we, is it between having coronavirus versus dying of hunger, right? So the oh. question is, that's that's the debate. That's, I mean, it's the first early days um, of, of it, but still you see the simmerings. But so the thing is that it's very easy to criticize the government, but the challenge that it's like a tsunami that has come in for any government to have 1.3 billion people with look at from right from daily wage to the rich, to transportation, to everything else, and it's 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 going to be daunting 
and uh, uh, having that this is the second day of the 21st day a lot of while a lot of people um, have been locked down at homes and the richer class and the middle class can are finally uh, i would say appreciating what labor force have been doing and subsidizing their work for many years or generations i guess this is the first time that the middle class and upper i mean can you imagine dennis there is a tutorial by a famous actress of how to wash dishes so yeah. so that's where it is and in anywhere this is that's where the the, the scientist dennis is. yeah anyway so i i to start this off dennis is and then i mean in 1970 6970 i mean con- i mean congratulations on your 50th year of earth day um uh, i'm not sure whether you would have been imagining that 50 years down the line in 1969 you will be speaking to on your 50th anniversary to a bunch of selco characters in india under these circumstances um so and after 1969 i we didn't even think we'd be speaking to anyone in 1971 it was to be a one time <laughs> event then it just kept going how did you think even before the iran crisis of 73 why i mean why 69 that you thought it was i mean even today people think it's so quote on quote fashionable you were way be people say you were beyond your time but you were much more how did that thought process start and it would be interesting for my colleagues and ourselves to know a little bit of that um well one important thing about 1970 is that it came out of the 1960s which was sort of a a unique decade in american public political history we had the anti-war movement which had become incredibly vigorous in the late 60s of the civil rights movement which had achieved some of its early legislative victories but then had a couple of assassinations including Martin Luther King and and riots that broke out in many cities uh it was the beginnings of the feminist movement we had the the summer of love in San Francisco and Woodstock and the great cultural uprisings and in the midst of all of that different people had different issues that they that they tried out it was almost like software companies you try this you try that you try something else and it seemed to many of us that um that there was a deterioration that was happening between the growth of the gross domestic product the increased wealth of the country and the overall well-being of the country and that that we needed to be paying much more careful attention to what was growing and what was not growing and 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 this applied itself to all of the kinds of things that you see now uh major air pollution problems uh the the air then in Pittsburgh or Gary Indiana Chicago was very similar to the air in say New Delhi today uh we had water pollution problems with you know some rivers that caught on fire we had lakes that were dying a, a great many places that people had grown up swimming in the river or fishing in the river they were now signs up saying that it's it's full of poison you can't swim you can't fish and uh we were raping the landscape and freeways were cutting through vibrant inner cities and, and we just had a sense that if we could tie all of that together all of these different strands that were fighting their battles over this freeway or that river or this endangered species uh and tie them into one big movement where they would all cooperate uh, there could be a hugely powerful new force and so this was an effort to take all of those different strands and weave them into the fabric of modern environmentalism and have everybody pull together i should say that at the beginning of it as well it was it was very important that we were cooperating with standing on the shoulders of and part of the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement we we talked about the use of agent orange in southeast asia as an environmental issue we talked about rats in the ghetto and lead points that poor children were pulling off of the walls and eating as an environmental issue so it it was an effort to not just have this movement that movement another movement but to have if you will the movement for change and and dennis do you think the uh, times have changed in the last 15 years for a concept of a movement like that if if you had to start today would it be same different more acceptable more pushback oh boy if if you're talking about the overall society I, i'm guessing that uh, there's for the environmental components of it uh more pushback 
1970, when we first had these huge crowds in cities across the country, an estimated 20 million people, which in America at that time was a lot of people. Um, and then we got a number of groups engaged in, in a dozen congressional districts for what we called the dirty dozen. These were members of Congress with bad environmental records where they were in districts where the environment could be an issue. It's difficult in the United States to defeat an incumbent member of Congress. It tends to be easier to raise money. You have wide name recognition, you have all of these advantages. We defeated seven of the 12 members of the dirty dozen, including two who were members of power, who were chairman of powerful committees. When all of that came along, then suddenly everybody was jumping on this bandwagon. And um, for a few years, we were able to pass the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Green Mammal Protection Act, Superfund, Toxic Substances Control Act, FIFRA. It was, there were maybe 20 major pieces of legislation that passed in eight years. And although there was opposition from the economic interests that were being uh, constrained by this legislation, uh, we nonetheless had sufficient popular support that we were able to ram it through. That, as always happens in our political system, produced uh, this uh, pendulum swing. We, we pulled things sufficiently in a pro-environment direction that, that suddenly uh, the forces on the other side gathered. It came in with President Ronald Reagan. He appointed a guy named James Watt to be the overall czar of the environment, a woman named Ann Gorsuch, who was just vile to head the Environmental Protection Agency. And things swung back the other direction. And then Jimmy Carter got elected and they went pro-environment. And uh, excuse me, Carter was of course before Reagan, but, but then after Reagan, we had Bush who was sort of in this intermediate phase and then Clinton came in and he was pro-environment. Then the second Bush came in, he was anti-environment. Obama came in, he was pro-environment. And today we've got Trump who is probably the most anti-environmental head of state that the country has ever had. And, and and before I ask another, uh, I mean, more serious question, can I, can you just, uh, I know you would be bored to, uh, the anecdote that I hear, is it true that you had more um, uh, 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 people at your rally than Nixon on a particular day? Oh, we had, for, for Earth Day, we had the largest planned and organized event in American history. There had never been a political rally that was like this. Uh, it, it, it Again, in the United States, I, this probably doesn't seem so impressive in a country with 1.3 billion people, but 20 million people was one out of every 10 Americans participated in Earth Day. There, there was, I, I think maybe the anecdote that you're talking about is, is Nixon was in the White House. He wasn't participating in any Earth Day events. We didn't invite him to participate in any, but he was seeing these crowds every place. And while he he wasn't much of an environmentalist. Um, he, he was a canny politician. And he also, in something that is very narrow and very American and probably uninteresting in India, he launched something called the Southern Strategy, which was to reconfigure his political party fairly significantly. But that had real opposition within the Republican Party. And some of those opponents did come and they were part of Earth Day, including the mayor of New York City, who let us shut down all of Fifth Avenue, the major thoroughfare in the city. So we had about a million people just in New York City participating. And when Nixon saw all of this, he figured he had to somehow get himself associated with this cause. And so that's how uh, a president who, who actually wasn't an environmentalist at all, with an executive order, established the first environmental protection agency. According to his chief aide, he made that decision the afternoon of Earth Day. And Dennis, I mean, if you if you uh, uh, see, I mean, in a sense that to to my colleagues who who uh, on on my half, when uh, an era in 1970, no cell phones, no emails, no social, um, what you call Facebooks and Twitters, to do mass movements. What was the one or two critical that actually brought so many people together? What what was that? Uh, what was that channel at all? We, we always referred to it as the magic of Earth Day. We never had a very clear idea of, of, of why this resonated so very much. I'll, I'll give you a couple of theories. One is about the channel and the other is uh, about 
the demographic that it particularly appealed to. Um, for the channel, basically, we had to get public media to cover us as stories and give people who read that who were interested in us a, a, a mailing address or a telephone number that they could call so that they could contact us. The thing that really kicked that off, and this was a, a huge bet that I made, is we invested about one half of all the resources we had in a full page ad in the Sunday New York Times announcing that this day was coming. And so many people responded with checks. We had a little coupon on the bottom of that where you could send us donations, but it, it paid for the ad two or three times over. And that just began to generate a lot of magazine coverage, and newspaper coverage, and television coverage. And so we sent it out by broadcast and then it came back to us through narrowcast, but, but very slowly, I mean, it was snail mail. You, you'd stick something in the mail and five, six days later, you, <laughs> your recipient would, would get it. Then the other thing is that um, the people who responded overwhelmingly, especially in the earliest days, were women with college educations, typically between 20 and 35, who were in single wage earner families. And they were often at home with their children. They, they had a bit of time on their hands. Uh, they had not been much involved in these other social movements and cultural movements of the 1960s, but there was something about the environment that particularly appealed to mothers. And so all of our earliest organizers, not all, but, but a huge fraction of our earliest organizers were these people who'd never been involved in anything political before. In, in fact, for many years, whenever I met anyone who was a woman and a member of Congress or a member of a public utility commission or a state legislature or a city council, uh, they'd always come up and introduce themselves and tell me that the first thing they had ever done politically was Earth Day in 1970. Uh, that is thanks for. I mean, now if you fast forward, and because many a time when we when we observe a country like America from outside, we always felt that irrespective of which political party comes in, the institutionalization process in America is very strong and it's very difficult to destabilize an institutional once it's set up, right? Do you think that's true? I mean, in the sense, I mean, relating to the question that Huda has put up on chat, that has the Trump administration done irreparable damage to the work of EPA? And has it pushed back the, protect, the, the whole environmental movement and protection perspective by some years, from your perspective? For sure. Uh, the, the, there, there is this sense of the deep state, the bureaucracy that continues to go. People have civil service protections and they can get to relatively high ranks in government. And once there, they are difficult to dislodge, though not impossible. What, what Trump has done is to bring in a number of people who on a wide variety of issues are the antithesis of the Obama administration. It, it's probably the clearest way to predict how Trump will react to anything. If Obama was for it, Trump opposes it. If Obama opposed it, then Trump is for it. And, and they have just consistently um, tried to undo progress that had been made. Though I, I don't want to limit it to progress in the Obama years. Trump has been trying to undo literally 50 years of environmental progress and you know, he, he believes that coal is truly beautiful. He's doing everything he can to try to restore the coal industry, give it massive subsidies, get rid of pollution controls on power plants. Um, there are almost 100 rules and regulations that have been promulgated over the last 50 years that Trump thus far has uh, reversed through executive orders and through regulatory rulemaking. And we're, of course, keeping a complete list of all of those. And as soon as Trump is kicked out of office and we get one of our people in, the first thing we'll do in the first three months is turn that around and head the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> that, and what, and it's from, a, from a champion of both the environmental movement and the civil society movement in the United States. One thing that, one or two things, whatever comes to your mind, that we, we in India should do from a civil society perspective and what we should not do from a civil society perspective that you as as civil society that's something that the united states environmental movement did something wrong or and something that was right and which was which which was not muddied by any political influence that we could copy well i should start by saying that 
Since we've taken Earth Day International in 1990, uh, one of the clearest lessons that I've learned is that uh, the people of India do not much want to have a, a middle-class white guy from the United States tell you what you should do. <laughs> They're going to do what's appropriate to Indian culture and Indian politics, Indian economics, and, uh, and I don't understand that the way that you do. Some things that we did wrong, and there may be lessons in this for you, uh, is that having begun with this effort to have a broad encompassing movement that dealt with social justice, that dealt with peace, that dealt with trying to get rid of violence, and human rights, um, and, and tie that all to issues dealing with the environment, which have came rather rapidly to be uh, applying principles of ecology to urban areas, principles of ecology to industrial processes so that we could begin to function like a natural system instead of thinking of human beings as something separate and apart from the fabric of nature. Um, as that passed, groups became focused once again upon their own narrow issues. And um, we lost the support that we had enjoyed from uh, African Americans, from Hispanic Americans. Uh, it became something where there was a political party that became strongly anti-environment where in the early days, uh, although the Democrats were always a bit more pro-environment than the Republicans, we had dozens of environmental champions in 1970. There is almost no Republican member of Congress today who would ever vote for a strong environmental bill. I'm not sure what we could have done to avoid that, but it has created this incredible polarization that makes progress, particularly deep, enduring structural progress, like, for example, our Green New Deal, almost impossible to achieve. So, uh, I mean, if, if you look at, um, like any other sector, per se, where we want to inculcate some sort of um, that thought process in the younger generation, I mean, if you look at the ITM, they start computer science very early in, in, in if they talk about uh, some other like manufacturing, they start very much in mechanical engineering or earlier or design, the way the STEM projects work in the US. What, how do you, how do you create the thought process of sustainability that you're seeing, I mean, for the future generation, if India has to bring up with, come up with good number of environmental thinking uh, policy makers, environmental thinking students, uh, uh, citizen movements, et cetera, in terms of sustainability, we need to inculcate something in the school education system that needs to be rather than just a paper for exams. How, how has, do you think that that has got lost around the world at all that we're not building that generation of, of youngsters? And, and today when Selco Foundation has a chance to actually influence some of the educational, a lot of my colleagues come from the education background. What would you tell us that in a matter that to produce the next generation in, in uh, what can we inculcate in the universities and the schools? And for that, that's little nervousness. Are we producing that next generation? Uh -huh. um, well, we have uh, set up environmental curricula that have been distributed by national organizations of environmental educators distributed to all of their members. Uh, in, in our little Earth Day organization, we have an environmental education coordinator in virtually every K-12 school in the United States that we send materials to each year. Uh, even having the day, and I, I don't want to, I mean, <laughs> I'm identified with Earth Day and as a consequence, I'd probably give it too much prominence. But at the, the very fact of having a day when virtually every school in the country will focus upon environmental issues. And most teachers have put it in their lesson plans and will be doing it for a week before and a week after as well. That, that's an asset that if you were a human rights organization, wouldn't you like to have a day or a couple of weeks where every school was focusing upon your issue and discussing it with students at a level that's appropriate, whether you're a first grader, a sixth grader, an 11th grader, um, and, and so this concept of establishing something like that, we do it, for example, in civil rights in the United States around Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. And, and, and there's a, a Black History Month that, that doesn't get quite as much intensity. But um, at least for us, 
that has been so far a, a very useful instrument. I'll say that at least in American culture, those days tend to become corrupted. So we have, for example, Labor Day, which was supposed to be when we honored the working class of the United States. And now it's a day when stores are trying to sell you all kinds of commodities. It's your Labor Day sale. We have Veterans Day where we're to commemorate the people who gave their lives or suffered serious injuries and wars defending the country. It's once again become an opportunity to sell products. I mean, heaven's Christmas for all things has become the, the biggest gift giving occasion there. So far, Earth Day has not become corrupted as one more instrument of capitalism, but, but that's a constant fear out there. Well, there's a romantic question from one of my colleagues on the right in the chat box. Uh, not a rom I mean, sorry, uh, sorry, Shripati, but the question is, um, the Earth Day was coincidentally after the year we went to the moon for the first time or the same. Um, yeah, and uh, the image of Earth shot by astronauts changed the way we look at the planet. So, but today when the contexts are so different, what do you think would bring people of the planet together in the most eff effective way? It's, it's not, I mean, climate change has been not like the way the pandemic has brought it, or is it something else? I mean, I don't know whether you're able to see, Dennis, the questions on the right. Uh, no, I on. see on the right of my screen is just uh, a series of boxes, most of them black, one of them with your phone your video. You know, in, in, on the below, there's a chat. Chat. Uh, if you uh, click the chat icon. Yeah, do you have the chat icon in the below? I, I do, and it's clicked. Oh, wait a second. I, it, it was orange. I thought that meant that it was on. Uh, when I click it, it comes black, and I can actually see the chats. Thanks. So um, I'm just well, with, the question. Yeah, sorry. Continue. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there will be anything that um, is as singular as the photograph of the Earth over the surface of the moon, the famous Earth rise photograph. Though candidly, although I think that was important uh, for us on the first Earth day, I think it's, it, its importance has been somewhat exaggerated. I don't think it's more important than the Santa Barbara oil spill or the Cuyahoga River catching on fire or the Great Lakes dying or the bald eagle becoming an endangered species, although it's our national emblem. Uh, all of those things came together. Uh, and I think today, similarly, what hopefully will bring the planet together, and this may be, I'm confident it is uh, incredibly naive, but the hope was that as the internet spread around the planet and people with even inexpensive telephones could act, get access to it and, and develop relationships with distant parts of the planet, we might my daughter and my granddaughter have friends that they have never met who live on other continents. They probably know better than some people who live three houses down from them on their block because they form these little groups. One way or the other, and this is the desperate need that we have, a prejudice that is still largely acceptable for the vast majority of people on earth is that if someone is born on one side of a border, they are worth infinitely more than somebody who's born on the other side of the border, even though those borders are just arbitrary lines on maps drawn by people 50, 100 years ago. Uh, and th this, this planetary issue where you have things that affect the global commons, the atmosphere that we all share, the oceans that are part of our mutual wealth, uh, species that transfer over boundaries and migrate thousands of miles each year. So you're doing everything you can to maintain the habitat for butterflies or the birds in your neighborhood. But unless somebody along their entire migration corridor is taken care of it, they will go extinct. We have to be able to pull together as a planet, pull together as a species. Uh, and I, my, my hope had been, and I guess to some extent I still cling to it, is that the, the web will give us an opportunity to tie ourselves together in a literal web. The, the depressing fact is that the most common time when people unite and form as a group is when they have a common enemy. I mean, if we could have an invasion from space, <laughs> maybe Homo sapiens would pull together to fight off the alien invaders. Uh, but uh, that's not going to happen. And I, I wish we could somehow begin to treat uh, climate change, for example, with that same kind of unified passion. Dennis, two, two uh, last questions before I go into the bullet part of the conversation was just that, uh, uh, I mean, the two questions, one from Sarah and one from Gunajit, one who says that can, she says, can the magic uh, 
of the earth day be created at, in, in this sort? Because if you look at your uh, the time of the 69, 70, 71, there were a lot of heroes. I mean, in the sense, heroes in different movements. Um, and, and, and you've been on the environmental movement. That, that, that inspires us, that people who inspired uh, people to follow. Um, that's something that took the magic to happen. Can that be done? And number two is that the unfortunate COVID shutdown is people are saying that's helping the environment uh, coming back. But is that just a, it's just a, that we are wiping the uh, wind, wind, windshield for a little bit of time before the fog takes over? And is that, is that actually true help to the environment? I mean, those two questions on the right of Saras and Gunajit, before I come to the bullet part. Uh, okay. Yes. Um. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, the COVID impacts uh, are likely to be, uh, for the vast majority of people, relatively temporary. And there will be great pressure for people to return to normalcy afterwards. Uh, President Trump already is saying, we've got to get back. We can't have people shelter at home, working from home. We've got to be as we were two weeks ago. And I, I, those, those pressures may be irresistible, though I, I suspect in the course of this, there have been some things that people have done where uh, they've suddenly recognized that that they can be as productive at home. They can get by with far less transportation than they were doing in the past. Nobody much likes climbing in your individual automobile and driving by yourself for an hour to your office and another hour home in the evening. If there are ways to avoid that, I suspect they will happen. Um, I, but but for those who say, yeah, pollution levels have gone down dramatically, much less carbon has gone into the atmosphere since the COVID virus is here, I suspect most of that is going to disappear relatively quickly once industry and transportation gets going again. And it's entirely possible, and I really regret saying this, but I think it's entirely possible that it may set us back on some environmental things, particularly in areas like public transportation, which is where an awful lot of communication of communicable diseases takes place. This this could result in people who were taking public transportation before starting to avoid it. Uh, there is, I mean, now uh, coming to two things. I mean, in a sense that um, um, uh, you've been running the Bullet <laughs> Foundation in, in the Northeast of, uh, uh, sorry, Northwest of the US. Uh, just a little bit background for my colleagues and also, um, I've, I've shared the information of the iconic building that you run, um, a brief history and, and uh, the replicability part of such buildings. And, and what, what is the message or that you wanted to send out with that building? First, the foundation and the building. The, the, the foundation is in the, uh, the grand tradition of American philanthropy. A, a woman built a broadcasting network and made a great deal of money. When she died, she passed it on to her children. Her children already had quite a bit of wealth and, and an act of generosity. They put all of that money into a foundation uh, to try to do good, but they had made no decision about what the foundation would do at the time they put the money into it. They brought in a number of people from around the country and some would say, well, this is what you could do if you focused on education. And others, this is what you could do if you focused on the arts or this is what you could do if you were going to be focused on criminal justice. And I was brought in to talk about what you could do if you set up a regional environmental philanthropy. The, the one thing that the mother who actually made all the money set up, with, she, she, she had a small foundation already that became much bigger upon her death. The one thing that she cared about with that initial foundation was that the money be spent where it was earned. And it's a relatively small foundation by American standards. And so it's, it's uh, it had to be spent in the Pacific Northwest part of the country. So in any case, they decided to become an environmental foundation. And I got a call two weeks later, asked if I'd like to come and be president. So I was able to be in at the time that it was born as a, a meaningfully larger foundation than it had been and, and to shape it. Initially, because we were the only environmental philanthropy in the region, we did a little bit of everything. We were enormously opportunistic. And, just wherever it seemed like our resources could win a battle, we would go and take on that battle. Uh, there are now dozens of environmental philanthropies in the Pacific Northwest, and we've decided to focus upon an area that most of them are not. 
most are focused upon, because this is a beautiful part of the country with a lot of wild spaces in it, a lot of them are about the preservation of nature, creation of parks, the preservation of species. Uh, we have some endangered orca whales out in Puget Sound, grizzly bears and salmon. And so we decided to focus instead on people and in particular upon cities. And so we're focused on Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and Vancouver, British Columbia, where we're working with city executives and mostly with activist groups within those communities to try to do what we can to turn them into models of urban sustainability. Within that context, one important part is buildings, which, as you know, consume a huge fraction of all the energy in the world in the United States. About 40% of all energy goes into operating buildings and the equipment, the computers, the phones, the printers, the what have you, inside those buildings. So we decided to try to make a model of something, say, if, if we could build something that was dramatically more sustainable than a standard building, and to do it at no increased cost and to run it as a standard commercial structure, not with environmental groups inside, but with commercial companies inside. And it all turned out you know, well, and we could get a bank financing. And somebody came along and was willing to offer us enough money that it showed that it was a reasonable investment to have been made, that we would then have proven the concept and, and maybe at that point it would become easier to pass laws and otherwise simply to encourage developers to have other buildings like it. So we did. And, and we're, Seattle is the cloudiest major city in the contiguous 48 states in the United States. And we get all of our energy from the sun. And in fact, for a six story structure, we produce more energy each year than the six stories underneath it use. I think it is still the only six story uh, net energy positive building in the world. And to do that in the cloudiest city in the country is, is kind of remarkable. And we do that by being dramatically more efficient than anything else. We, we use about one fifth as much energy per square foot as a building that is built to code. We use about half as much energy as the uh, lead platinum building would do. It's the same size as ours in Seattle. Uh, similarly, we capture the rainwater that uh, uh, falls on the roof, use it for all purposes. Uh, Start in a 50,000 gallon cistern in the basement. And during the rainy season, we save up enough that we can get through the dry season. Uh, we treat our sewage right inside the building. We have nothing in it that is toxic, or carcinogenic, or mutagenic, or otherwise would be harmful to our tenants or to the people that built the building. And we did all of that at a cost that was no more than a standard building like ours elsewhere in the city by making a decision about things that were important to us and things that we could omit. So in a nice office building in America, you would have granite countertops, you would have marble on the entry walls, you would have uh, maybe some sculpture around. Uh, we don't have those things. We, we've instead put it into FSC certified wood, put it into all of these solar and other features. It's produced a building that is strikingly lovely, but the loveliness is through design, not simply through putting in very expensive materials. And then finally, most importantly, we located it on a major, the major east-west bus route out of Seattle. We are about a quarter of a mile from a trolley, a third of a mile from a light rail. Uh, we've got uh, rental cars uh, that are available on the streets. We've got Uber and Lyft that are commonly available. There are two bicycle companies renting bicycles for anyone who wants it. And we came to the conclusion that we could keep the building fully tenanted without having a parking garage for automobiles because we were trying to get people out of automobiles. So that big savings by not putting in a parking garage was the thing that really made it work economically. And that also gave us the space for the cistern and other things that are in the building. See, when you, when, you, when you started the foundation and when you built that building, in your mind, you were thinking that a couple of stakeholders, whether it's a policy or the building codes would change. What has been the biggest success from, a, from moving the needle after, after the building got built? And what didn't move that you had yeah. expected would have changed? Um, well, candidly, we were more successful outside of Seattle than inside of Seattle. I mean, we, we did work with the city council and we, we had we, we passed a living building ordinance and a deep green building ordinance to give incentives to developers to build buildings like ours. And um, 
actually got building codes nowhere near our building, but tightened them from where they had been before, so that now you're required to build buildings that are more efficient than before we started. Um, and we are working now to try to get rainwater to be captured in Seattle and stored as well and used for potable drinking water. So that has been a harder push because we have so much water in Seattle that people feel there's no need for it. But it's the fastest growing city in the United States and with climate change we'll have less snowpack in the mountains building up water reserves for the summers and uh, 30, 40 years from now there will be a need to capture rainwater and cisterns are really cheap and you should put them in when you're building the building because they're very expensive to retrofit. If you do it right from the start, they're inexpensive to go into a building and create a cistern, a roof collection mechanism to get the water to it and, and to purify the water. That's hard to retrofit. So not successful on that yet, but we're making, I think, some progress. The, the thing that it did not happen, and, and that's that Seattle is the fastest growing city because of one thing. It's Amazon. Uh, its world headquarters is in Seattle. It has been growing just at an astonishing rate. It, it leases more office space in Seattle proper than the next 40 companies combined. So Amazon is the market for buildings. And Amazon is sort of a digital Walmart. They are just trying to drive down the costs of everything. And to the extent that they see a building like ours, they say, well, yeah, you saved all that money by not having a garage in it, instead of putting in that solar stuff and that water cistern, just give us a lower rent. And that's what they've been successful with other developers because everybody wants to lease to Amazon. I should say Amazon has improved in the last year or so, but for the last six or seven years, eight years, 10 years, uh, it has been a very negative force in terms of green development. The basis of my question, uh, Dennis, was because uh, when you last came and visited us, Dennis, we did not. We actually now have a very strong built environment team inside Selco Foundation, and the built environment team. Um, see, the thing is, what we're looking at is by 2035, 40 to 50 percent of the buildings, and especially focused on the poor, have not yet been built. And many of these, whether it's health centers, whether it is childcare centers, whether it's rural housing, or it is anything that is related to poor, the design is poor, the material utilization is poor, the daylighting inefficiencies of these buildings have actually led to um, saying that, oh, we need lighting during the daytime. Inefficiency of livelihood products have led, led to saying that, oh, we need coal fired plant. Efficiency of every sort, like for example, livelihood applications, building designs. So we also have something like a 200 square foot challenge inside the organization saying that, in 200 square foot, where a lot of the livelihood applications are, like a swing machine, silk weaving, can we redesign like a Ford factory where the design of the swing machine person's house is in a way that increases productivity, increases efficiency, and, and, and overall. So that we, have a, we have a strong team of eight to 10 people inside the organization that look at building efficiencies right from like maternal labor rooms to uh, livelihood centers to, to everything. How do we bring in energy, sorry, efficiency of building material to solar as a link to after we develop all these. So that's the, that's why I was leading that question to, um, to you, Dennis. No, it's and, very important. It's one of those things where uh, for almost any product that's an innovative product, uh, at least this is the American pattern. Uh, the first, many of them are relatively expensive. And as you move into larger and larger scales of production, the price falls. And that means that in the early stages, they tend to go to people who are well-to-do or at least middle class, as opposed to people who are relatively poor. And then it becomes thought of as something that's elitist. Um, and the, the great transition is when you get from the fact that, that, that an iPhone is something that means that you are upper middle class to an iPhone that really means you know, you're, you're a citizen, everybody has. Uh, then that, that's a wonderful transition. We're on the cusp of that with regard to solar energy now. If, if, if individual consumers could see the capital costs and everything of, of the centralized power plant, we, we now find that in much of the United States, it is cheaper to install and operate a solar system than it is merely to provide the fuel for a fossil fuel power plant. And so on pure economic grounds, we win. 
Of course, the customers never see those comparative costs. So the only way we're going to get there is through policy. And so that's what we've been doing, shutting down existing power plants and making sure that no new coal-fired power plants are built anymore. Um, but it, it, in the course of doing this, we're trying to achieve exactly what you're doing, uh, which is to say every place that uh, there is money going into housing for uh, the disadvantaged, we're trying to make sure that they don't have the unhealthy housing, housing with, with terrible lighting systems, and poor heating systems, and lousy insulation. Uh, and that once again, you have that pinch where the, the people who provide housing have a linear focus. They want to get just as much housing built as possible because we have a desperate need for it. And if you build it cheaply, uh, then you uh, can build more of it. And what we're working so hard on is to figure out ways to get things that are inexpensive and yet have these requirements that you not place people in the, the things that will keep them disadvantage for generations into the future. They're less productive, they're less healthy, their kids are less healthy. So, so Dennis, I mean, I know, see, with the way when we met last and we went, uh, met, and the last I met you was in Seattle with Anand Padmanabhan, who has now become a trustee of Selco. Um, yeah. the, the way we have pushed a little bit uh, is that we are saying that let's not use the word off-grid and on-grid in India, because people saying that how do we electrify the last mile and 200 million Indians are without electricity. We've basically started the narrative that why are 700 million people on the grid, on the grid in the first place, right? And saying that that's a, a, why completely shift the narrative. And two is by providing grid electricity, we are, we are saying that we're not anti anything. We are saying that why are you morally pushing a future expensive electricity on the poor? When today solar makes sense in a decentralized fashion for livelihoods, health and education, which are energy, pushing development as a centerpiece, and, and climate change being absolutely an added benefit, automatic added benefit, saying that solar makes so much of economic, social, and environmental sense. Why are you pushing other forms of fuel, which are going to be future expensive, and you're, you're pushing existing poor to be future poverty in a manner? And that's the, that's the push we are saying that, so that uh, taking the development angle, you know, many of, our, many of the countries in the South become very positive, saying that, don't tell us. And now with related to that, if I'm requesting David is, Dennis, sorry, is, could you, could you remove the hat of being a middle-class white guy and, but say that you are a human being and in front of you, there are 80 potential, 80 plus potential future champions who are, who have come in from a development perspective and environmental perspective. How do you think they should look at what the future of next 25 and they could start working on uh, from, from what, what you have done over the last 50 years. So right in front of you, you have 84 as I see now. So, and as a human being, so it's not about preaching that I'm going to preach from America to India. Let's, I mean, it's environment just like the virus is, does not understand uh, country boundaries. What would be your advice? I say that you should pay very careful attention to Harish Handy and model your life on his. Uh, <laughs> the, let, let me comment on your earlier statement and then, then get into this somewhat more seriously, Harish. Um, for us, uh, the grid itself is not an evil. It's just a matter of scale, an appropriate scale. So we're, we're actually quite strong enthusiasts of microgrids and believe that for many things, the individual household is, is just the wrong scale and the individual office building is. We, we should not be treating sewage in our building. It, it, it doesn't make any economic sense. That's a constant ongoing. It should be on a community scale. And similarly, you, you can have all kinds of resiliency in your system if you're providing your water and your electricity and your food and other things. It's something other than everybody taking care of themselves. Plus, that helps you create a sense of mutual reliance and, and of community. So we're, we're enthusiastic about that as opposed to the, the traditional American value of uh, you're, you're a loner, you're off by yourself, you gotta take care of yourself. It's you, your, your family and your gun. <laughs> um, but having said that, the, the lesson I guess that I would draw uh, from my decades in this vineyard 
has been that you want to be just as all encompassing as you possibly can by making what you're doing interesting and available and attractive to as wide a diversity of people as possible. So what you, for example, were just talking about with regard to building the appropriate kinds of facilities for the poor, that's something that, that somewhere got a little bit lost along the way in the United States and we're trying very hard to, to recover that and it made social justice a crucial part, for example, once again, of this Green New Deal. It's, it, it tends to be thought of just as, oh, let's put solar energy on everything, but it's really about public transportation. It's, it's about housing for the poor. It's about a much better diet. It's about oh, all sorts of things that just get lumped together in this, this package that may be so big that it just never can pass, but, but at least now we've got a vision that we can be aiming for. So that's, that's important. You have to have a goal that can be widely shared by the entire society because if it's not shared, those that are not part of it are gonna be your opponents. It's gonna be a fight for resources. And, um, and the worst of those is if it becomes a, a fight between the haves and the have nots. So uh, finally, uh, uh, Dennis, um, uh, a, a tricky, uh, but yeah, um, question, not a tricky question. You were, you were in, um, in India um, 2011 March. And I was not sure whether it was your first or one of your first visits to India. Um, is, uh, I mean, I don't know how much you uh, remember from that, that you had inaugurated a energy center in Dharmastala sure. with Mr. Absolutely yeah. right. So in, in the, I mean, we never had a chance to reflect on that visit afterwards. What, I mean, what did you take away positive and what did you take was a little bit shocked to you from, from, from the angle that you were coming in? Well, this, this is not what you're going to expect, but by far the most shocking thing to me on the trip was when you and I had lunch with a couple of people who were doing installations um, and it came up that all three of the people that we were eating with followed Kim Kardashian on Twitter. <laughs> Sound like I've got the coronavirus there. Um, it, it, it was the first time that I truly understood the enormity of this crazy aspect of, of the way that these social media were spreading out across the planet. Um, I, I guess the thing that I liked the best was the attention that you were paying to, again, pulling in everyone. You had a religious leader there who provided us with the accommodations that night and had been a, a part of your program. You were focused upon folks who would not be able to afford their own solar systems, but would be able to afford batteries that they would pick up at the end of a day when they'd been recharged. I think it was a tailor's shop or something. They'd take that power home at night so they'd have something that they could read by, a little bit of electricity. It was a model that I'd not seen in operation before, and it was a creative solution to something where you were faced with the real problem of a lack of resources. There was no way to put solar collectors and batteries in every house, but you didn't need that. You needed to have that combination of solars and batteries serving a wider community. It's, it's that scale thing I was talking about earlier. But I think that was just a, a smart way. Somebody had some capital and can turn it into a business and other people have a need to turn that into consumers. You solved it. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. I mean, I know we have two more minutes, uh, Dennis. We just want to say that um, the challenges, in fact, uh, from now a little bit from an India perspective are increasing because um, we see a large scale droughts that are pushing even the poor in the upper levels of the poor in terms of financial back to two steps below in the poor. I mean, just to give a last anecdotal is uh, last year, we actually had to, there was a drought camp of 8,000 um, 8, uh, cattle and 1,000 families just and all staying together away from their villages and homes because there was no water at all. Forget for agriculture, which is, which is it's having a pain point. Many of these farmers were also reliant on, on, on uh, cows and milk and dairy where actually had come because there was no water to feed the cows. And uh, so we've actually put up uh, 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 solar powered... Uh, shaft cutters and milking machines, as well as heat, heat stress tents. Um, and that, I still believe that solution of ours was a band-aid. 
um, is a complete bandit because you're you're creating a de facto refugee camp for four months out of the year where you're taking schools. But that's the threat of climate change, which is which is it is it is not in unfortunately middle class in India is still thinking it's in somebody else's backyard. I forget the world. I mean, it, middle class in India is thinking so. Hopefully, um, uh, hopefully the champions that you have on this on this uh, webinar, the 83 of them, uh, one way or the other, uh, keep it. And I'm so honored. We are so honored, Dennis, that uh, that we've been able to catch you on the 50th year, and along with the 25th year of uh, Selco, um, and see where it goes. And hopefully, we meet very very soon, uh, Dennis, and and we can have you back in India as soon as all this uh, chaos is over. I'd, I'd very much like that, especially if I can figure out a way to do it without such a large carbon footprint, Harish. Yes. So the, the honor really goes the other direction. You, you've done an amazing job there under often pretty adverse circumstances, and you've been relentless and creative, and I'm, I'm, I'm just very honored to have you as a good friend. Well, thank you. So thank you, Dennis. Thank you for that. Thank you, colleagues. I uh, hope we've had a memorable uh, webinar, which we'll always remember. 25 years down, down the line that we had this webinar. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.